Great to see everybody here today, whether you're in the room or watching in a different room online. Welcome. Thank you for being here as we conclude the first three chapters of Ephesians today. And this is a, it's a prayer. Remember, from chapter 1 in Ephesians, Paul had a prayer. And now chapter 3 concludes the first half of Ephesians. Th six chapters long. Paul wrote it from prison, as you may recall, church of, a, of um, I don't know how many people are in the church, but the actual city had about a quarter of a million people, and this wonderful church rises up out of all this, this pagan culture. Paul starts it, and he begins to share with this church the glories of what we have in Christ. And so these first three chapters really deal with theology, the theology of Christ, we call it Christology teaches us about who we are in Christ, what Christ has done for us, how blessed we are. We have been purchased by God, by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been forgiven and accepted by God into His family because of Christ. We are now sons of God, sealed with the Spirit of God, protected by divine love, sustained by divine care, energized by divine power, we become priests and kings in the kingdom of God. We are taught and led and ruled and loved and made alive and built up and blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ. We are possessors of the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. We are rich beyond imagination. We've been given unlimited resources in Christ. We're more than conquerors. Life in time and life in eternity will bring us more thrilling, fantastic, fulfilling, utterly comprehensive riches from the goodness of God. All this in Christ. Remember, he prayed in chapter 1, verse 17, that we would have, uh, we'd be filled with all wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened, that we would know the hope to which we have been called. All this in Christ. So this is just marvelous. Chapter 1 then is a prayer for enlightenment that we would understand as Christians, as those who have come to faith in Christ, all the blessings that we have in Christ. And now we see this prayer in chapter 3, and it is a prayer for enablement. In light of all the riches, all the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ, now we need to live in this spiritual power. So chapter 1 is a prayer for knowledge. Chapter 3 is a prayer for application, that we could live in the reality, in the power of Jesus Christ here on this earth. So, setting this all up, but think about this. There's no more important call that could be given to Christians than that we pursue Christ, that we know Christ, that we focus on Christ, and that we understand what we have in Christ. The rest of the world, the unregenerate world, has no way to find true solutions for the problems of life. We, because we are in Christ, we have the answers to life. We gather in places like this church this morning to celebrate the meaning that we have found in Christ. Christ has given us meaning. He has given us life. He's given us everything we need. Before Christ and without Christ, people are void of true purpose, of eternal purpose and meaning. But in Christ, we find that. We need nothing more than Christ. And if you have in your life unresolved dilemmas, unsolvable problems, fears that are crippling, depression and anxiety that seem to ruin everything, can I tell you, it is time to understand and live in the power of Christ because if you are living that way, it's that you haven't yet learned how to tap into the heavenly resources that are already yours because of the indwelling Christ. And so now we come to the prayer. I'm going to read through it, and then we're going to break it down, and I'm going to show you three prayer points to help you live in the power of Christ based on Paul's prayer in Ephesians. So here we go. Let's just read through the prayer. For this reason, Paul said, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. And you're going to see that word in this prayer three times. Power, power, power. Through his spirit 
in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have, here it is again, power. It's a prayer for power. Together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp, listen to the language here, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And now to Him, verse 20, who is able to do, notice the language here, immeasurably, you can't measure it, more than all we ask or imagine. I can ask and imagine a lot. God can outdo all of it. According to, and here it is again, His what? Power that is at work within us. To Him be glory in the church. We saw that last week, that God is getting glory from angels and demons and saints and all of creation through what he is doing right now in the church and in Christ Jesus. And this is through all generations, all generations, not just ancient peoples, but now and forevermore, through all generations, forever and forever, in the conclusion of the prayer, amen. So be it. So here is this powerful, powerful prayer that we see. So he's praying. I'm praying that you're not going to be weak and disheartened. I'm praying that you're going to be powerful people, exceeding your own expectation. I don't want you to live on the short end, stumbling and bumbling around in in weakness, just crawling up to the level of average. No, he's saying, I want you to live beyond your expectations. Now unto him who's able to do immeasurably more than all that we could ask or or think. To think big, to dream big in God, to believe God. For things, unimaginable things in this life. Is that your prayer? Is that your mindset? Are you just kind of tapping the shallows of life and just kind of bumbling and stumbling along? Full of fear and anxiety and depression, discouraged. Or are you living in the power of Christ? The goal of this prayer is that we might experience verse 20. That we might come to the place where the power of God within us is doing things that exceed our imagination. And that's what this prayer is all about. Praying for the power of God to be in our lives. That we may see the glory of God. That we may see the goodness of God in this world for His glory and for others' good. So these three prayer points for living in the power of Christ. This is a prayer for power in your life. And this is a prayer that Paul prayed over the church at Ephesus. Again, chapter 1, he's praying for that knowledge. Chapter 3, he's now praying that we would, in light of that knowledge and all we've been given in Christ, that we would live in this power, that we would have spiritual power in Christ. And so the first thing I want you to see is this, that he prays for inner strength through Christ's Spirit. Inner strength. Let's take a look at it here in verses 16 and 17. He said this, I pray that out of His glorious riches, I mean, know that God has riches, glorious riches, joy and peace and love and goodness and provision, anything you need, God has it. And He's saying, I pray that out of this storehouse of God's riches, that He may strengthen you with power. God wants you strong in spiritual power, ability, divine ability, divine grace, that enables you to overcome whatever life throws at you, that he may strengthen you with power. And where does that power come from? Through his spirit, through the Holy Spirit, in your inner being right in here, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. If you can picture with me a ruby red Corvette. with chrome wheels, high-performance tires, that brand-new leather smell, fuzzy dice in the mirror, of course, Bose speakers, 400 horsepower. I don't know how many horsepower, but there's a lot of horses under there. 
And right beside that is a 1979 Chrysler whatever rusted through with a little four banger that only hits on three cylinders. About 12 horsepower rusting through bare tires with steel coming through the treads. What's your spiritual life more like? The Corvette or the Chrysler? Now, I hope we're saying the Corvette, but let me just say this. You jump in the Corvette, and nowadays you push the button, right? And you push the button, and you get nothing. The ignition is not working. You've done that on one of these cold main winters. You jump into your car early in the morning. It's one of those 10 below days, and you go to turn the key and push the button, and there's nothing. Click, 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 nothing. Well, it doesn't matter how many horsepower you have under the hood. If the ignition system won't put it in to get, turn the thing on and get it, put it in, you can't put it in gear and go anywhere. There's no power. What good is it? You know, it's a $75,000 paperweight sitting in the driveway. Or you could get in that rusty piece of trash, and at least it starts. <laughs> What's your point? My point is this. That in Christ, we are the Corvette. We have been given the glorious riches of heaven. I'm not talking about material possession. That's part of it. I'm talking about the glories of all the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. The power is available. But if you don't know how to turn the ignition and get contact and power it up, start it up, it's not going to benefit you. The power of Christ is the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The power of God infuses us. The Holy Spirit infuses us in our inner man. Only the Holy Spirit can infuse strength in the inner man. When you get that phone call that you lost a loved one, and your emotions begin to well up, but somehow unexplainably, there's a power and a strength in here. You feel the grace of God. That's the Holy Spirit. When you don't know what decision to make and you're in confusion and you're reeling and you pray and say, God, I need help and I need wisdom. And just like that, you know what to do. When you're being persecuted or criticized and nobody likes that, but all of a sudden you feel a strength rise up on the inside of you. And you know, if God be for me, who can be against me? There's a joy, there's a peace, there's a love, there's a goodness that comes with the Holy Spirit when we are filled with the Spirit. That's precisely why Paul says that you're to be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5, where he says in Galatians 5 that we're to walk in the Spirit and will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In Colossians 3.16, let the Word of dwell in you, the Word of Christ dwell richly in you. There is a power, there is a strength that we are to live in, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is praying for this church in the middle of a pagan culture. He's praying that out of God's glorious riches that we would be strengthened with power through His Spirit on the inside. And that is a prayer that we would yield over to the power of the Holy Spirit in our life and find spiritual strength. With the Holy Spirit comes power, and with power comes the potential to strengthen the inner man. So what we have to do is continue to feed that inner man on the riches of the Word of God in yielding to the Spirit, obeying the Spirit, which leads us to the mind of the Spirit, which yields us leading to the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. And that's the prayer. God, I pray that we would be strengthened in our inner man, that we would have that power out of your glorious riches, all that we need, Lord, you have provided. And let that be ours in Jesus' name. I heard a wonderful story many years ago. It never left me of 
someone who was very weak uh, physically and spiritually, had developed a stomach condition, and they couldn't eat. When they would eat, it would come right back up. And uh, this person was um, in the hospital and was visited by someone who was actually one of my teachers. And he went in to see her and he said, hey, sister, how you doing? And she could barely talk. She had no energy. She just, I just, I'm just so weak. I'm just so weak. And every time I eat it, it just comes right back up. She labored in her breathing and just speaking. It was just, she had no energy. And he said, sister, I understand. You, you need God's intervention and His help. But would you do this with me? Would you just begin to pray the Word of God with me. The Bible says this, let the weak say, I'm so weak and tired. Let the weak say, I am strong in the Lord and in the power of whose might? His might. You may be frail, you may be emotionally spent, you may be on the edge of just throwing up your hands and giving up. Paul said it this way, when I am weak, then I am strong, because then I'm relying and depending on the power of Christ in my life, knowing that I'm not trying to accomplish it myself. I'm just going to hang on to the Lord. You know, if you're going to be successful in the Christian life, you've got to have some grit. You've got to have some... Do you have any of that? And so she could barely speak. He said, sister, just say this with me. I am strong in the Lord. I am strong in the Lord. And in the power of His might. And in the power of His might. And he said, that's good, that's good. And he just kept coaching her. Just, just get the Word of God in your mind and in your heart and in your mouth. And stop talking about all the weakness you have. Let the weak say, I am strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I am strong in the Lord. And she just began to pray the Word. Pray the word. Come, let's magnify the Lord with me. All the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yes, and in Him, amen. Just began to stir herself up. And she said pretty soon she started to get a strength about her. Now she's, she's being weaned off her own strength. She's depending on the word of God and His strength. She said, pretty soon, he said, I'm not ta- saying long, maybe 15 minutes. She's sitting up in bed in a conversational tone now. She's saying, I am strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. She said, that's right, sister. That's what the Word says. You just hang on to the Word. And if you die, die trusting Jesus. I mean, no, in Hebrews, people died in faith. You die, keep trusting Jesus. You keep speaking His promises. You keep living for His glory. You take Him at His Word. And if you die, you go to heaven, praise God. But at least you're standing for something instead of just yielding to every fear, every weakness. No, we're, we're strong in the Lord in the, the power of His might. We're being strengthened in our inner man by the Holy Spirit. And so, he said, that's right, sister. He said, now I want you to keep. He said, after a half hour or so, she's up. She was like screaming. When he came in, she could barely move. I am strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He said, that's right, sister. And he said, here's what I want you to do. Next time you eat, he said, that food may hit your belly and you may throw up. He said, if you do, here's what you do. You wipe your mouth. I said, I am strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And you just keep holding on to the Word of God. Fight the good fight of faith. Trust the Lord. And if it doesn't turn out the way you want to, you died trusting Him. I would rather go out that way than all scared and timid and fearful depressed and anxious. Paul said, listen, do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know you're seated in heavenly realms with Christ Jesus? Led in triumphal procession in Christ? You know the angels, you're going to judge angels someday? That the Holy Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. And pray that you would be empowered by His Spirit in your inner man, strengthened. And then he goes on to say this, and don't just pray for inner strength in Christ's spirit, but pray for intimate knowledge of Christ's love. And I pray that you, being rooted 
and established in love may have, here it is again, power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp the ungraspable, to fathom the unfathomable, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that you can't even know. You don't just know about it, you experience the love of God. The love of God. When you begin to meditate, for me, this is how it happens. When I begin to meditate on some of the old hymns, but the old hymns are still my favorite. And I think it's because so much, there's so much good theology in the old hymns. And I'll just kind of begin to reflect on a song about the cross. I'll begin to think about how deep the Father's love is for us. And does this elicit emotion in you or is it just me? Begin to meditate upon the goodness of God and reflect how God demonstrated His love for me in that while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me, for this pimple-faced kid from Brewa who came from a broken home and had a stupid mascot called the Witches in high school and took me out of that situation and saved me, put His Spirit in me, has helped me my whole life and been so kind and so merciful to me, even through my faults and sins and zeal and mixed motives, begin to reflect on the love of God. And the emotion just comes. Almost every time some of those hymns will just do it because I'm, I just am so thankful for the love of God. God loved the creator of the universe, the almighty, the all-powerful one loves us. I don't think we stop and say la that enough. And we're always, often, I shouldn't say always, thinking about how we've messed up and what worms we are and how we've sinned, and that's all true. But spending more, a little more time focusing on how God, in spite of all that, has loved us and wooed us, and empowered us to know, and wants us to know what Christ has done for us. When Christ can settle down and just be at home in your life, there's nothing unclean, there's no glaring sins, you've confessed that, He just fills your life at every point with love. It's, and you experience it. And you comprehend that which... You can't know in the flesh, but by the Spirit, you just begin to understand just glimpses of how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. Amen. The only way to really live in the love of God is you know it, but you experience it. It begins to change your relationships. You begin to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, your neighbor like yourself. It's wonderful intimate knowledge of Christ's love, what He's done for us. It's kind of like jazz. Anyone here like jazz music? Some people like jazz. Some people don't like jazz. Someone who did not like jazz came one time and talked to Louis Armstrong. You know who Louis Armstrong is? That famous jazz trumpeter. And he said, all right, Louis, you just got to explain this thing to me. I just don't get jazz. I just don't like jazz. He said, man, if I got to explain it to you, you ain't got it. And that's how it is with love. Somebody has to explain it to you. You ain't got it. But if you've got it, you can't even explain it. It's what Paul's saying here. When Christ settles down and is at home in your life, you begin to live a life dominated by love, which is incomprehensible apart from experiencing that. It, it isn't just going to come through some rational means. It just kind of overtakes you. People are always saying the greatest thing in the world is to love and to be loved. It's the greatest emotion in the world. It's the most wonderful, exhilarating feeling in the world, true love. Don't you remember when you first were in love with your spouse or 
You just, you know, I, you're like on a manic Zoom. You're just like, oh, I'm, I'm in love. You think about it all the time. You just, it, it just dominates. And that is precisely what a Christian experience is. Total, who, someone is totally committed to God and the love of God. It just dominates you. Dominates your thinking. And I'm not saying that you don't have ups and downs and valleys and suffering. I'm not saying that. But this is the predominant emotion, not just emotion, thing we experience in this world is love. I remember one of the worst, the most amazing days of my life was we were living in Glenburn. We had just started the church and found out that one of our children had been hurt by someone in the church, a family friend we had known for 25 years. And I've always, always especially in my youth, I used to lose my temper and I'd, you know, break stuff or punch something or I know it's hard to believe. But I, I would say this, you know, if you can hurt me, but if you hurt my kids or my family, I'm going to kill you. And I really meant it. I would envision like beating people with baseball bats if they hurt, you know, I to, shooting them or you can't believe that, can you? I know. See what the grace of God does? Just like a saint now. <laughs> don't, don't say that to my wife. But talking about the love of God, I, so I, my wife had a look on her face like, oh, no, something horrible has just happened. And she said, we need to go for a walk right now. And I'll never forget the walk. We're walking, and she began to unfold the story about how this person had hurt one of our children. They betrayed us like a Benedict Arnold, you know, or Judas Iscariot. And, you know, so you have waves of emotion and hurt and anger all kind of rolled up into one. But what stands out to me now many years later is the powerful feeling, I don't know if that's the right word, um, I don't know how to describe it other than like a wave of God's grace hit me. And in my mind, I determined, okay, I will get, we're going to be safe and I'm getting the police involved. I'm doing what I have to do to make sure everyone's safe. So on the one hand, I'm checking the, you know, the father protector box. But on the other hand, these just powerful emotions sweeps over me. And instantly, it's just a miracle. I forgave. And instantly, it was like, I want to see this person in heaven. I can even love an enemy. That doesn't happen in my natural mind, in my flesh, does it you? And I'm telling you, it swept over me. <clears throat> and it's, it's almost incomprehensible how you can forgive and wish the best for someone and wish for repentance and at the same time be mad and broken and hurt emotionally and it all happened just that quick. There's something about the love of God that puts everything in perspective where we see eternity is a long time and we need to take as many people to heaven with us as we can and we need to make sure that we are obeying the Lord to the best of our ability because we're going to be with Him forever and we want to please Him and we do want to love people and this just begins becomes the dominant thing in your life and Paul is praying that I pray that you would have this intimate knowledge of Christ's love, that you'd have this inner strength from Christ's Spirit, this power, and that you'd have the power to know the love of Christ and experience that and live in that. And then finally, pray for infinite filling of Christ's fullness. And I've got to explain this one. This one is maybe the least clear. The infinite filling of Christ's fullness. Look at verse 19. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That statement in itself, just trying to grasp that, is a, is a bit mind-boggling. What does it mean? What does that mean? Here's the simplest way I can break it down, and I think this is what it means. It simply means that we're going to be like Him. When the fullness of God is dwelling in our being, we're going to be like Him. What does that mean? 
It doesn't mean that we're God. We're not going to become God. It simply means that the essence of who God is and His glory is going to be filling your life. And here's, here's how I can kind of illustrate this. We're blessed in the state of Maine to have over 3,000 miles of coastland, coastal, and, and all the harbors and inlets. If you stretched out the coast of Maine, you could get from Maine to California, right? It's, it's that long, our coastline. And what comes in to the coast is this thing called the Atlantic Ocean. Up here, it is cold, isn't it? I remember one time I was out on a sailboat on up Penobscot Bay somewhere, and I think it was July. And I was just kind of, eh, I'm going to dive off this boat into the cold Atlantic. And I remember just diving off. And the moment that water hit me, it sucked all the oxygen out of my lungs. And I'm like, oh, my word. The Atlantic Ocean, second largest ocean in the world, beautiful, cold, but we have, you know, beautiful things swimming and crawling in the water here, lobster. Depending where you're from, scallops, or if you're down south, scallops. You know, those little shrimpies and just clams, steamers, dear, haddock. I'm getting hungry. What time is it? No. <laughs> but if you take a glass and you go down on the coast of Maine and you scoop up that cold ocean water and you look at it in the sun, all of the ocean is not in my glass. But all that the ocean is, is in my glass. The essence of it is contained there, not the vastness of it. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. It's all the vast infinity of God is not going to be in me. I mean, how would that even be possible? No, but what God is by virtue of His nature is in me. Evidenced by the fruit of the Spirit, His love is in me now. His joy is in me now. His peace is in me now. I'm filled with the measure of His fullness. The essence of God is in us now. And so he's praying that, that we would be filled with the infinite filling of the fullness of God. So let's get down now to why we can be spiritually powerful people, why we don't have to be weak, em emaciated spiritual beings when we are filled with the fullness of God, empowered, strengthened by His Spirit dominated in our thinking by His love, experiencing it every day. And this takes us into the final part of this prayer in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. In light of that, now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. I could ask or imagine a lot. How about you? The biggest dream you can dream for God the biggest thing you could ask of God, God said, I can, I can do way more than that. Imagine when God was talking to Abram. See the, the sand on the seashore? See the stars in the sky at night? That's how many descendants you're going to have in this world. Billions. Blue is mine. I wonder if sometimes we cut ourselves short and we don't begin to dream for God. Because, you know, we're just checking the box at work or just kind of checking things off our goal list, and we don't even begin to think about what, God, what could you do for, what can I do for you? What can you do in my life for your glory? Now to Him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according, and here's the key, to His power that is at work within us. To Him, we saw this last week, be glory in the church. God is using you and me, people. That He's called out of darkness into marvelous light. He's using us to reveal His glory in the heavenly realms. Angels and demons and saints are seeing the goodness and the glory of God by what He's doing right now in the church and in Christ Jesus. And this isn't just for people in ancient history. Throughout all generations and forever and ever. Amen. You see, it's possible for us just to remain in the shallows, 
we're not believing God for anything. We're not seeing the power of Christ. We're just kind of bumping through life like everybody else. But powerful lives for God are built on these spiritual principles and this, this prayer. Not clever ideas, not just hard work. Spiritual power and the path of spiritual power goes right through Ephesians chapter 3. And if you're not seeing the power of God in your life, could it be because you're not filled with the fullness of God? And if you're not filled with the fullness of God, could it be because you're not rooted and grounded in love? And if you're not rooted and grounded in love, could it be because you're not strong in your inner man through Christ's Spirit? Let's close in prayer and ask God to fill us with His fullness, that we could be rooted and grounded in love, strong in Christ's Spirit, that we may live in the power of Christ for God's glory. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for this wonderful prayer, this prayer of enablement to live in the power of Christ. My prayer, Lord, for myself, selfishly, but for all in our church family, is that we would have this inner strength that comes from Christ's Spirit. Lord, that we would have and live in the reality and experience this intimate knowledge of Christ's love. Lord, and that we would be infinitely filled with the whole measure of Christ's fullness, the essence of Him within us working so powerfully. Father, I pray for those in particular that aren't living in spiritual power today, but they are living in weakness and fear and frailty and hopelessness. Lord, that's not the path for your children. Even when we are weak, we are strong. And I pray for this inner strength that comes from your spirit. And I pray for this knowledge of the love of God to permeate our thinking. And I pray that we would be filled with all the fullness of God for your glory and others' good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.